Imagine you're on a game show. You have to choose which of three doors has a car behind it. You make a choice. Then the host opens one of the other doors, but there's no car. He now tells you you can either stick with your first choice or switch to the remaining door. What do you do? Stick or switch? In fact, you should always switch. Your initial choice has only a one in three chance of being correct. When the host then opens one of the other doors, many feel the chances of their first choice being correct has increased from one in three to 50-50. And if the chances are now 50-50, why not stick with the first choice? Switching and being disappointed could be frustrating. But your chances haven't increased to 50-50. There's still a two in three chance that the car's behind one of the doors you didn't choose. And since the host, who knows where the car is, has opened one of them, the car is now twice as likely to be behind the remaining door than the one you chose initially. In experiments using this game show scenario, the so-called Monty Hall dilemma, the social scientist Graham Bergen Brown found that 88% of people stuck with their first choice, showing a clear lack of awareness of the probabilities involved. A poor understanding of probability leads many people to make inaccurate statements in support of their beliefs. Someone on YouTube recently wrote to me, you're free not to believe in God, but the chances that he exists are 50-50. There is either a God or there isn't. This person is free to believe in their God, but the chances that it exists are not 50-50. The fact that it's possible to phrase a statement so that only two options are mentioned doesn't mean that they're equally likely to be true. I could say, there are either two gods or there aren't. Then I could say, there are either three gods or there aren't, and so on. All perfectly reasonable statements but if we assign a 50% probability to each possibility and then start adding the probabilities up, we quickly go way over the maximum 100% probability allowed. A 50% chance can't be assigned to these statements, but there's a complementary thinking trap here too. The fact that you can propose an infinite number of scenarios, each with a different number of gods, doesn't in itself make the probability of there being only one god infinitely small. The truth is, you can't use logical maths to assign any numerical probability to the existence of gods. Belief in any god is a matter of personal faith, a fact that's recognised by many theists. To go beyond faith and claim to be able to establish the existence of a god or gods as fact, we require what's needed to establish the existence of any disputed phenomenon, independently verifiable evidence that doesn't require a pre-existing belief in that phenomenon in order to be persuasive. None of this kind of evidence is currently available for the existence of any god. Another flawed approach that makes use of the power of numbers is the argument by retrospective improbability. You're told that your life had to be part of a design plan because the chances of all the events occurring that had to occur in order for you to have been born are impossibly small. This specious logic would dupe us into believing that when we pluck a blade of grass from a field or a grain of sand from a beach, we're performing some miracle of improbability. After all, the probability of choosing that blade of grass or that grain of sand is infinitesimally small. The problem is that everything we see happening around us has a breathtakingly intricate and chaotic physical history behind it, extending back over billions of years. It's not actually possible for you to perform a single action that doesn't have an inconceivably vast number of complex physical events preceding it. Even if the entire history of the universe consisted only of a single coin being flipped 40 times, the chances of any particular sequence of heads and tails occurring would be one in over a million million. You can't erase the complexity of the history behind anything you do, and you can't use that complexity to cast doubt on the possibility of something that's already happened or is already in progress, like your life. If we walk onto a beach and pick out one grain of sand, granted it would be impressive for someone to predict which grain of sand we select, but the fact that we're inevitably going to make a selection from billions and billions of possibilities is mundane. Like our selection of that sand grain, neither your existence nor the existence of anything in the universe requires that there is or ever has been an intricate designed plan. The use of probabilistic statements to argue against certain scientific theories can often expose a fundamental lack of understanding of those theories. For example, flawed definitions of evolution are often triumphantly dismissed with Fred Hoyle's tornado analogy. 
dazzle them with impressive improbabilities seems to be the ploy of the person who states that the odds of humans popping into existence by chance are the same as the odds of a tornado in a junkyard assembling a fully operational Boeing 747. In their enthusiasm to argue against what they think evolution means, some even go so far as to offer statistics for this scenario to try and drive home their point. But when asked to explain how they arrive at these remarkably specific numbers, they always seem to be less forthcoming. And there's a very good reason for this. Assigning a precise probability to a scenario involving such ill-defined variables as tornado and junkyard exposes a lack of comprehension of the methods by which probabilities are determined. So we know immediately that any statistics given for this scenario will be entirely fictitious. What's sad is the energy people waste trying to prove that humans didn't pop into existence by chance. If they knew the basics of what they were arguing about, they'd realise that no one's actually claiming humans popped into existence by chance. Scientists find that idea as ludicrous as creationists. If this surprises you, then you have many more enlightening surprises ahead of you when you study what evolution is really about, rather than listening to the false representations of anti-evolution propaganda. Likening the evolution of humans to the production of a dictionary from an explosion in a print factory shows the same fundamentally flawed understanding as saying that babies explode fully formed into existence at the moment of conception. Like the physical development of a single animal, the evolution of life on Earth involves both arbitrary and non-arbitrary factors. When people use analogies like tornadoes in junkyards and explosions in print factories, these are just creative ways of declaring something impossible, which is nothing more than the expression of opinion. Unless the analogy can be justified, which in the case of evolution it can't. When people use numbers or probability to argue for the existence of supernatural entities or divine plans, it's time to slow things right down and take a long look at exactly what's being suggested, because the argument will always be wrong in some crucial respect. No god can ever be deduced through mathematics. Calculations of probability require defined variables and parameters, and when it comes to the question of gods, there are simply no variables or parameters with which to make calculations. Many people not content with viewing the existence of gods as a matter of personal faith ape the language of maths and science so as to give their beliefs the gloss of authority or plausibility. But when they attempt to justify their faith using scientific terms, they stray into an area of rigorous scrutiny where personal opinion without solid evidence simply carries no weight. Flawed arguments that present what is a matter of faith as a matter of fact will always be exposed. Ooh, a tangerine thumb man. <laughs> I have no objection to people who believe in one or more gods, provided they're not abusing or disrespecting others. But any attempt to argue that it's more reasonable to believe in a god than not believe must always be made on the understanding that without evidence, all such arguments will perish under the spotlight of examination. 